Well, we are very, very lucky to be welcoming another um, incredible creative to our podcast uh, to chat with us today. Um, We have the wonderful Ashley Raymer Brown here. Welcome, Ashley. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hi. Thank you for being here. She is an independent (laughs) filmmaker from Northern Kentucky. She uh, co-created the theater downstream in Kentucky, the community theater. She recently started several projects in regards to the reaction from COVID. Uh, Mm -hmm. So hi, Ashley. Will you tell us a little bit about who you are, how you kind of got started as a creative, and um, just let our audience know a little bit about you. Well, I was born Ashley Reamer Brown, and I stayed that way. So I've been (laughs) married for 12 years, um, but my mom was a very strong feminist of the 70s, and she kind of taught me to be who you are and keep your name. And my name is my mom's name and my dad's name, so that's who I am. That's who I've always been. Um, How I became a creative. I don't know a time where I wasn't a creative. It's always what I've wanted to do. It's always what I wanted to be. I can't stop myself from being a creative. I I kind Mm -hmm. of, I've tried to define like, who am I or what am I? And I think that in the basic term, I'm a producer, but not in the classic term. I like to produce content and I like to find people. I like to come up with projects and find people who can be in those projects. If it's me, great. But if it's not me, that's almost better because I love bringing people together who don't know what they're capable of. That's when it's really amazing. When you bring all these people together with all this potential and you give them this project and they rise to the occasion, that's when I feel like, oh, I have just, my heart just, grows three sizes that's what I love yeah doing. <laughs> awesome nice. did you have to do a jump from like film to theater or were you always had kind of a theater background okay so it's a really <laughs> weird story I I have this career and it's it's I guess it's a career I don't necessarily get paid for it I'm not mm-hmm. on the payroll of the theater downstream everything I've done is volunteer except for directing I do get a stipend for directing, mm-hmm. but everything else that I've done for them. I, so it's not, it's not my career, but it is like my job. It's my full-time job, even though I'm not being paid for it. Right. But so I'm 41. I'm going to be 41 in a few, a few days. And I grew up wanting to be an actor. I want to be an actor. This is what I want to do. I want to act. I have no idea how that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I watched, I didn't, I didn't have, my family was, I don't want to say like, poverty stricken but we were not wealthy so we didn't have the the funds to send me to acting school or anything like that I didn't do acting in school I didn't I didn't even start acting in a community theater wise until I was 20 I just Mm -hmm. knew this is what I always wanted to do but I was painfully shy as well like there was a moment I think it was in seventh grade where I just made this decision within myself and I said you've got to stop you've got to stop being so shy and the only person that can change it is you so I sort of started coming out of my shell a little bit then but I'm still tremendously introverted and shy and um, sometimes I get called aloof but I'm just I'm just shy I don't know how to you know come out of that until I get to know people um Mm -hmm. So my point is, I watched Cary Grant, I watched Audrey Hepburn, I watched Catherine Hepburn, I watched all these people, and I said, I want to do what they're doing. And I learned to act by watching them. And um, I had a friend, or I started, so I I went to community college, and it took me seven years to get a two-year degree, because I was, Mm -hmm. my dad and my granddad were helping me pay my way, and it took a couple classes I was working and all that kind of stuff. And I took a class called Theater 101, and by the time I took Theater 101, I was like, how old was I? 20, 24. And I had already been in community theater for four years. I'd been, had a couple supporting parts. I'd, I'd never had a lead until 2017. I played Annie Sullivan. That's the biggest role I've ever played in the miracle worker, <laughs> nice. but it took me 17 <laughs> years to get to that point, you know? And, um, So anyway, I took this class and I was already, the teacher said, you're already so well versed in theater just from learning and hands-on experience. I don't know why you're in this class. And I said, well, because I don't want to take algebra. So she told me, well, let's, let's come up with a different final for you. And I just out of the blue said, well, what if I wrote a one act play and produced it and directed it and, and filmed it? And that was my final. And she said, okay. And I said, oh, 
now I have to really do it. So <laughs> I had this idea for a show. I, I recruited a couple of my friends. My um, They acted in it with me. The, the fella ended up becoming my husband many years later. But <laughs> he was in it. My brother was in it. My best friend was in it. My best friend at the time. And that was sort of the start. And then there was this, um, at the theater I was at at the time, they had this thing called the coffee house. So nobody ever wanted to do this. It was just, um, you always got saddled with doing the coffee house. So it was where mm -hmm. you would get local actors and you would have them sing or do whatever. And then you would assemble it and patrons would come and pay and eat donuts and coffee. And it was just a little one day entertainment. But I've always had this thing where I like go overboard. So I said, all right, I'm going to do the coffee house, but I'm going to write a musical and I'm going to put like songs i mean it wasn't done the proper way because it was songs that i didn't have the rights to but it was just you know mm -hmm. you just put stuff together so i picked all these songs and wrote around it and it was like this 20 person cast with teenagers i had no idea what i was doing but i just did it and it was this enormous success they ended up adding a performance and the next year they told me i could have the main stage which was the downstairs so nice. then I wrote this um, super musical with like 40 people in it. The opening song was this big deal and it ended up having extra performances and being this humongous thing. So then I was like, Ooh, now I can direct. Right. And at the time I'm 26 years old. I have looking back, absolutely no experience other than I've been acting. I've done a lot of shows. I've watched people. I just know I can do it. And so mm -hmm. they're all going, I remember one lady actually actually telling me, oh, honey, you're good enough for the coffee house, but you're not nearly good enough for on stage. Like, no, you're just not Yeesh. good enough. And so Ugh. I then that's when my mantra was adopted, which was watch me. So anytime somebody says it's kind of like Marty McFly, if you call him a chicken, you just are yellow or whatever it was. It's just like, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's going to be what I do next. So that's what I did. I, um, there was a director that had dropped out. It was 2008 and he had some health problems. I really don't remember why he dropped out, but I went to the board and I was like, okay. Oh no, no. I know what they did. They told me 2007, if you assistant direct, we will consider letting you direct. So I went mm -hmm. from 2005, I wrote the coffee house, 2006, I wrote the second coffee house. Um, the first coffee house, I have to go back and say it was the, the idea was conceived by my mom. So she came mm -hmm. up with the whole idea and I wrote the script based on it but it was her idea okay second coffee house third time i assistant directed in 2007 2008 i said okay i did what you, i did what you said and they were kind of stuck they were like yeah, yeah you're right so cactus flower was a show i directed in 2008 at this theater that the only theater i'd ever acted at i started with i was in a i was actually in a seat in the audience in 1999 watching this girl called susan shoemate and i watched her and i was like yes this is where I belong. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't go to Hollywood. All right. Okay. So theater, that's what we're going to do now. That's how I'm going to get to the next thing. And that's when I tried out my first show, didn't make it. Second show, I got four lines. So in the year 2000, the director actually ended up being sick and dropping out is the one who cast me in my very first show. So I got four lines. Mm -hmm. My second show, I was the supporting character in Moon Over Buffalo, Rosalind. So that was trial by fire. My third show was, uh, what was my third one? It was like, I think it was Carousel. And the director, I got cast because the director said, well, nobody else showed up to play Carrie Pipp Pipperidge. So you're going to be our back burner, Carrie. And all right. I was like, I'm okay. like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. All right. Got. Fine. <laughs> yeah. You're it. You're the one that showed up. Yes. So then nobody else showed up and he's like, okay, you're Carrie. I said, wait, I thought I was back burner Carrie. What do you mean? I'm actually Carrie. So I had to learn to sing and dance and <laughs> do all of that. But they had to bless them. They, they had to had change to. the key every night. Cause I'm a, I'm a mezzo soprano or alto. Mm -hmm. I'm low. I'm a low singer. And they had to change it every night. So that went on. All right. So my point is <laughs> I did a lot of acting. I was supremely confident and I had no business being this confident. In 2008, <laughs> I said, I'm going to direct. That's what I want to do. So mm -hmm. from 1999 to 2008, I made this humongous leap from an audience member to now a director of a main stage show. There was a lot of people who said, she's going to fail miserably. Like they told my stage manager, this is not going to succeed. She doesn't know what she's doing. But, and I don't know how you all feel about faith, but I prayed and I was like, hey, mm -hmm. I know, I know I'm called to this. I know this is what God laid on my heart when I was a little kid and mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. And it ended up being this 
amazing show. My husband, he wasn't my husband at the time, but he's this fantastic set designer. And uh, Cactus Flower has 16 set changes throughout the course of the show. So we just made it part of the show. And and the way the theater was designed, it's just a, a flat little room. It's not a stage. Mm-hmm. Like the audience so it's like is like a up. black box. Mm-hmm. Yep. The, the stage is like this tall. So mm-hmm. he just made it part of the the thing and he put it on a pivot. He does construction. So he put the set on a pivot and it only called for eight people in the cast. And I put eight more people in it to be background actors, but also to be set movers. And so the first opening night, they move this set and there's people in the audience that just, they applauded the first set change because it went from a apartment to a dentist's office in less than 60 seconds. And you nice. watched it happen. So we had all of it. Yeah, we had all of this happen. And um, so after after Cactus Flower was over, I transitioned to another theater. I kind of spread my wings a little bit. And I tried out for a part there. And they were this amazing group of people. They were so kind to me. And it was so good to see uh, a different kind of people group. And it was just nice to go, okay, this is something I can do other places. Mm-hmm. And I met a few people. Um, I met... And they ended up being really important later. So even though I always wanted to do another show there, but they're, they're further away from me. Not, it's just hard to get to them because I live in the the rural areas and there's no highway Mm -hmm. to them. So it's just, it's tough to get to them. And I always, and the scheduling just never worked out, but they, they are still the nicest group of people. And I support them. I love going to see their shows when I can. I would Uh love to do another show with them eventually if I ever can, but yeah. So I met a few people there. All right. um, Another girl that I had met, Um, at the theater I worked at before, she had this Christian independent filmmaker as a mentor and he Mm -hmm. had hired her to work on his film set. So she said, do you want to work with me and him this summer? And so he decided to hire me and I was a PA on this film set. And it was just like this huge jump. And I was like, yeah, I want to work in the movies. This is a chance to work in the movies. I think before that I had been a, um, I had been a background actor in a couple of films. So he knew who I was. So I worked for him for a summer. And again, this is just my complete naivete. After that (laughs) summer, I worked for him and he paid me and he paid her. And she said, you know, I have this script that I've I've written and I've always wanted to make a film. And I said, so have I. And I said, let's do it. And she said, okay. So we pulled our money and it was 2010, I believe. Yeah, 2010. Mm -hmm. So we, we split the cost of buying stuff and we spent... 16 weekends and a lot of the people in that movie were people i met at that theater in frankfurt so one uh two of the main characters came from there my husband played a role i played a supporting role um and oh meanwhile my husband and i had worked in another theater uh woodford so everyone that we cast in this film were theater actors and that's just that's just because that's who we knew so you guys want to do a movie let's all do a movie and so from september through december every weekend we filmed and oh, cool. just did what we could. Mm-hmm. And the surprise of our, I'll skip over. Cause I know this is a really long origin story, but I just have an unusual oh, origin story um, through just Providence and the, the wildness of the path that God lays for you. I ended mm-hmm. up, I entered it into film festivals. Cause I thought that's what you do. You have a film, you entered into film festivals, then you get distribution and then you are worldwide. And that's how it works. So <laughs> again, I didn't know any better. I am accepted into a film festival or we are accepted into a film festival. I go there. Our church paid for our airplane tickets to go to Arizona. Mm-hmm. It's the furthest West I've ever been. I loved it there. I love the desert. I thought it was gorgeous. <laughs> I, my, my friend and I, we took a distribution class And the distributor crushed every one of our dreams. He's like, distributors are out to screw you. They don't want your films. They just want to blah, 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 blah. But I still was like, okay, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something. And the weird thing was that we kept seeing this guy everywhere, everywhere we went in this festival. It was a huge festival, but he would just Mm -hmm. appear and he wasn't seeking us out. We weren't seeking him out. It was just one of those strange occurrences. And on the last day, even we went to the Arizona Mills Mall. We're walking around the mall. We go into the Rainforest Cafe. He's coming out of the Rainforest Cafe. What are the odds of that ever happening? Weird. So finally, she and I look at each other and we're like, you think God's trying to tell us something? Like, maybe we should talk I to this guy. So. And I think so. Uh, so the last, <laughs> so the, the, very, the very last day of this festival, all the awards are out. We didn't win anything, which of course we didn't because we're no ones. So 
the very last day, I tell my new friends that I've met there, which a lot of them I still talk to today. It was 10, it was 10 years ago this, this year, this August. And I say, look, this really weird occurrence has been happening where we see this guy everywhere. And I think that God's trying to tell us to talk to him, but it doesn't make any sense because he's already told us that distributors are not going to want our film, blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, if it happens one more time, go for it. I'm like, all right. So I go out in the lobby, everything's cleared out. And I go down the hallway, he's not there. I walk back, he's not there. I'm like, well, there it went. I'm talking to this couple. So I'm facing the doors, the clear glass doors. And this couple is standing there. This man walks up to the clear glass doors. He puts his hand on the door. He lets go and he starts to walk away. And I look at this couple. I can't remember their name. And I said, I'm sorry, I have to go chase this man. And they went, okay. So I run out into the <laughs> desert. I'm like, excuse me, excuse me. And he's like, yes. And I said, do you remember me? And he goes, no. And I thought, <laughs> okay, I don't know what to say now. So I just, I said, I have a film and I would really like you to watch it. So he says, well, could you send me a screener? And I said, what's a screener? <laughs> and he told me he was very kind. And he said, it's just a DVD of your play. That's all. So I said, yeah, I, I will. I will do that. I sent it to him and he loved it. Yes. He loved it. And he said, I want to represent you all. He came down Aww. and signed with us. The, this never happens, but his company paid to do all the audio fixing that we needed to make it oh, screen worthy. Awesome. And then, like, I don't remember how, how far in it. My mother and the fellow that was in, the, in our movie, his name was Tim Ellis. They both said, this film is going to be on TBN and it's going to go worldwide. I was like, guys, that's... We're nobodies. How's that possibly going to happen? They were like, mm -mm, but God is not a nobody. It ended up on TBN. Jan so Crouch, cool. before she passed away, she saw it. She approved it herself. And it it was on the, it's it's in rotation. I don't know. Sometimes it's on at three in the morning. It, I never still, know when it's going to be on. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> but still, yeah, but still. And so, the, so this is important to the story because right after that, I made a second film. Because my distributor said, hey, if you make one film, you need to make another film because people are going to want to see it. Mm -hmm. So we did that. He came down. He was super supportive. It's uh, auto, semi-autobiographical about um, some things that I went through. I was in a terrible car accident when I was 21. And I kind of I wrote about that and mm -hmm. um, just kind of worked through. It, writing that script is the first time I knew I had PTSD. Mm. So I worked through that. We had this great film. We're ready to distribute it. And he gets a job with another company. And he says, I'm the only one running this film distribution. And if I leave, there's not, no, not going to be anybody here to take care of your film. So I said, okay, well, we'll just self-distribute it. So it's on Amazon right now. And mm -hmm. I, I contacted other distributors, but they were not the same as him. You know, they mm -hmm. wanted me to pay for stuff. I didn't have the money. They said, we'll take your film, but you have to retitle it. And you have to pay to re-edit it. And you have to, you have to pay to do all this stuff. And I said, I don't, I can't. And mm -hmm. so I just made the decision. And it wasn't, it, he didn't, it was very amicable, but he gave us back all of our stuff and, and said, you know, bless you. I wish you well. And, you know, he just moved on to another company. He's the CEO of a major company now, which is a great move for him. Mm -hmm. But that just ended that. But. Okay, so I made the second film, and when I'm, I'm writing the second film, I'm currently without a theater home. I wrote a scene where I needed the main character, one of the main characters, to perform in a theater. And I didn't know anybody with the theater at the time, but my brother was best friends with this guy that worked at the high school, and I knew they had a theater. So I called my brother's best friend and I said, hey, I know your school has a theater. Can I come see it? He takes me in there. He shows me this amazing theater. We shoot the scene there. And I meet the drama teacher. And I say, I love your theater. I don't have a theater home. And I write him this fan letter, basically, because mm -hmm. he, he invited us to his spring musical. And he and this other lady were um, co-directors. I loved it. I loved what they were doing. And I said, I, I don't have anything to do with my time as far as theater wise. And, you know, movies are kind of dying down right now because the second one hadn't gotten picked up. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a third one and say, hey, friends, let's all do a third film for volunteer and I don't pay you. You know, right, that's just not right. fair. Right. So, um, oh, oh, bonus is with the money we were paid from the TBN windfall, we were able to pay all of our actors who were in the first film. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah they didn't expect it. They all signed paperwork saying we don't expect money, but we had kept a roster of if we ever make money, this is how much you'll earn. And we were able to pay all of the people that we had promised Aww, to pay. So that was yeah. cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that was really awesome. cool. Someday maybe I can do that with the Hepburn girls, but we'll see. <laughs> so I met I met this theater teacher, wrote him. I loved his show. I wrote him a, um, this fan letter and he never answered me. That was April. In August, he gets back to me, which I learned this is his personality. He's very much a scattered guy. And he's like, oh, hey, thanks. Um, we're going to have this audition workshop. You want to come and help? And I was like, yeah, I, I've got nothing to do. So I show up for this audition workshop. I meet him. It's August of 2013. And I start helping with the high school shows, just volunteering because I love theater. I don't have anything else mm -hmm. to do. Nothing's happening. By April of 2014, I said to him and his co-director and um, another friend, I said, you guys are really talented. You're really great actors because they had been acting, showing the kids how to do scenes. And mm -hmm. I like acting. I don't have anywhere to act. Why don't we start a community theater? And he was like, you're insane. No. Mm -hmm. And I said, why not? What's the worst that can happen? Because this is the way I've always done stuff is I jump first and then go, oh, what have I done later? So <laughs> I just convinced. Yeah, I convinced <laughs> them. Let's try it. Like, what's the worst that can happen? Let's let's go for it. So. I made a, I kind of filmed it as we were going. So if you go to my YouTube channel, there's way back in the dregs of 2014, you can see this basically documentary about how this group of people started a community theater. And I said, if we only do one show, what do you guys want to do? And they wanted to do a farce. So Jill Moore was the name of the co-director and she directed it because she was pregnant at the time. So she said, I can't act. I'm seven months pregnant. So I'll direct <laughs> it and you guys will have auditions and whoever shows up will cast it. You guys have to audition too. So we did. And we he and I ended up playing uh, Paul and Roz. And then some other people believed in us enough to show up at this high school and say, okay, we'll give it a go. And... That was the start, and it's been, what, six years and 19 mm -hmm. shows. Nice. And it was amazing. It awesome. We did Moon Over Buffalo. Then I wrote a bunch of sketches for our Christmas show, and then I had some one acts that I wrote for our spring show, and then we were supposed to do The Sound of Music for our big musical, and Sound of Music was on Broadway, and so we got our rights oh, taken away yeah. two weeks before auditions. So we said, okay, um, I had always wanted to do Beating the Beast. Mm -hmm. So I said, what if we do Beating the Beast? And it was touring. So I contacted oh. them and through some, again, miracle of miracles, they allowed us to do Beating the Beast if we would advertise the closest touring company, which was Lexington. Because I said, there is no okay. competition here. Yeah. Look at our high school and there is a field and there's cows. So we are not taken away from Lexington. And they were so good. The they said, okay, <laughs> it's going to be fine, guys. So we ended up doing Beating the Beast. And I will never, I'm getting like goosebumps on my legs. I will never forget opening night of that. That was just the most amazing time of community coming together it was nine weeks. That's all we had. We thought we were doing a completely different show two weeks wow. before auditions. And we just hit the ground running. And it was this enormous 40 person cast. And um, nice. Jill and I co-directed it. And we had our music directors are her first time ever music directing. She's like, how do, what do I do? And mm -hmm. the, um, my friend Rachel told her, she, Rachel's one of the co-founders too. She said, uh, just know the, know the music better than anybody else. She's like, okay, I can do that. And so she's ended up being our music director for every show that we've done since then. Aww, and nice. opening night, the, the cast actually thought that they were a flop because we do Be Our Guest and it's this... But I told them, I was like, guys, they were gobsmacked. There was this audience full of people and they were just stunned with the pageantry and the amazingness. And how did this come out of Henry County? That's the main thing everybody <laughs> was thinking is, how did this level of professionalism and and just how did this happen? We ended up winning um, Broadway World Award for best regional music, best musical outside. I forget. It's best regional musical or something like that. And our actor, Russell, who was one of the co-founders, he won for best actor in a musical. And our Belle, Elizabeth Irvin, won for best actress in a musical. Oh, and yay. Russell won for best set. That's so, awesome. yeah, this was just this. So that's how. That's how it happened. And it just happened. 
It just happened <laughs> because we said, uh, let's do it. And not only we did we just say let's do, do it. it, we just did it. And we worked <laughs> our butts off to make sure it happened. And mm-hmm. I think our continued su- success is we... We, we said, like, we want to have fun and we want to put on a good show. And the way we put on a good show is that our casting is always fair. Now, some people may not think it is because they don't get the part. But if you can show up to rehearsals, I don't care where you're from. We don't care where you're from. If you can make it, you can be in the show. So that is, it's not just Henry County residents. It is, we've had people come from Indiana. We've had people drive an hour and a half. In Little Women, we just had our our Joe was, I think she drove an hour and 20 minutes to get there. But Woodford Theater, which I considered one of the best theaters in my area, that was their policy too. They said, we don't care. If you can make it here, if you will commit to coming and you can get here safely and be okay, you're up for the part. So that's how we did it. 